I am a pilgrim, a wanderer. And a pilgrim is a wanderer with a purpose. A pilgrimage can be either to a place or for a thing. And mine is for a thing. Mine is for peace. And optimism to have faith and then to step out on that faith. It's amazing. It's wonderful. It's inspiring and enheartening. I think the truth of a person's influence stems more from the degree to which they're anchored in the universal truth of life, the, the great truth the, of all of our lives. And she, Peace Program, was. She was a living demonstration of the potential that can be unleashed when persons are fully engaged in doing what they believe to be the most important thing in the world. She spoke of peace in a time of war. My vow says I shall remain a wanderer until mankind has learned the way of peace. Now, I am praying for peace in the world, even though I talk mostly about peace within ourselves as a step toward peace in our world. You don't have to be good at arithmetic to figure out that if the nations of the world were to stop manufacturing implements of mass destruction, they could provide for every human being who lives in this world the basis for a very good life. She spoke of universal spirituality before spirituality was in vogue. Aren't they beautiful? I touched God many times as truth. All that intellectually and emotionally, I touched God as love and goodness and kindness and beauty. I felt God through the beauty of a sunrise or a sunset. And then reaching out through an awakened divine nature, I was able to perceive God as the ever-present, all-pervading essence or spirit, which binds everything in the universe together and gives life to everything in the universe. I learned from peace to do what I call dialoguing with God because she told me, Richard, I have the most wonderful dialogues with God. Sometimes I really argue with him. Sometimes I get mad at him. And once in a while, we have a real peaceful conversation. <laughs> She took a vow to walk penniless until mankind had learned peace. This is a real pilgrimage. It's actually a journey on foot. I don't hitchhike. I walk in spite of all the rides that are offered and on faith. I took a vow at the beginning that I would remain a wanderer until mankind has learned the way of peace. Walking until I am given shelter, and fasting until I am given food. And although I have never asked for anything, I can truthfully say that I have been supplied. She called herself Peace Pilgrim.
began January 1st of 1953. It's my retirement project, and I finished counting the 25,000 miles toward the end of 1964. I have not counted miles since then. Well, is it uh, very often that you have to go without food or without a bed on these walks? I seldom skip more than three or four meals in a row. I don't even think about food until food is offered. I once had a 45-day period of prayer and fasting. I know how long one can go without food. And even when I'm with total strangers, I have a bed about three-quarters of the time. When I don't, I might sleep in a bus station in a city or a truck stop out on the highway. But I have slept on the grass beside the road. I have walked all night to keep warm. If you're concerned enough about what you're doing, you don't mind any of these little so-called hardships. And I'm very concerned about peace. She certainly was a peaceful warrior, like Gandhi, like Martin Luther King, uh, like many other people who have a peaceful heart but a warrior spirit. The her sort of, uh of a commitment to propagate peace uh, and, and sort of, I think, the express through one of human action. That's the peace walk. And without any sort of, what's it, uh, what's it money or, uh, I'm seeking money or fame or some other thing, simply uh, carried such hard work, not easy, of course, hard work, Surely, through sincere motivation. It was wonderful. People became very interested in her as an individual and wrote about it. And this, this just uh, propelled her message that much stronger into the consciousness of people. <laughs> Does anybody who meets you anywhere in your travel think that you're crazy or out of your mind? They don't say so, but they're very curious, of course. After all, what I work for and pray for, world peace, is the desire of every human heart. They're all very much with me. The fact that I have been completely supplied without ever asking for anything indicates uh, how much they're with me and, of course, indicates also how good they are. You know there's good in every human heart, no matter how deeply it may be buried. If you love them and trust them or have faith in the good in them, you reach it. The world is rather like a mirror. If you smile at it, it smiles at you and I love to smile. When someone is peaceful, you don't have to ask them if they're peaceful. You just feel it and it's like a magnet of you're wanting to be around that person. That's true. And uh, I didn't see her as an evangelist trying to change the world in terms of making people do things, but by her own demonstration, she inspired people. When I realized what human potential really was, what people really are capable of, I looked around me and I said, how sad that most people only scratch the surface of their real potential. No wonder they have problems. No wonder society has problems. She was very famous in United Nations circles uh, by having these uh, demonstrations of peace and she was definitely one of the great uh, prophets of peace uh, at that time. We are now prepared to destroy more rapidly and completely every productive enterprise the Japanese have in any city. What in our society calls forth a peace pilgrim? Well, don't forget the Korean War was on. The McCarthy era was at its height. There was great fear at that time and therefore great apathy because the safest thing to do is nothing. At any time in any culture where there is great apathy in the face of a crisis situation, a pilgrim is apt to step forth. And a pilgrim's job is to rouse people from their apathy and make them think. Every age provides us 
with the uh, peace pilgrims. They may not walk, they may sing. They may not sing, they may preach. Some poet, some dance. She said, I shall name There was nothing ascetic in the sense of deprived about her. She didn't go around feeling sorry for herself and feeling like she didn't get to have what other people did. She gloried in the richness of her inner life and the richness of her connections with people because that's where true richness lives. Now, a pilgrim walks not only prayerfully, but as an opportunity to contact people. She called herself Peace Pilgrim. She walked this land for peace. And that's why I'm wearing my short tunic with Peace Pilgrim on the front and 25,000 miles on foot for peace on the back because it makes my contacts for me in a very kind way. I don't need to approach people, they approach me. And my message, one sentence, this is the way of peace. Overcome evil with good and falsehood with truth and hatred with love. You see, it isn't new, just the practice of it would be new, but I consider it the lesson for today. is impacted and it's strengthened by the fact that she lived it. You know, to, to go out and say, I am not going to eat, to have the kind of faith that she had and say, I, I'm not going to sleep until somebody gives me a place to sleep. I'm not going to eat until I'm offered some food. Uh, I'm just going to teach, if you will, my message of peace, my message of love, and have the faith that uh, all things will be provided. I took my vow of simplicity. I shall not accept more than I need, while others in the world have less than they need. And that was what motivated me to bring my life down to need level for me. And I realized that the need level of a pilgrim is about rock bottom. Most people would need much more than I need. For instance, if you're called into the family pattern, you would need the stability of a family center for your children. There are needs beyond physical needs. So I'm not telling you your need is the same as mine, but I'm just saying find your need level. When I found my need level, I felt a wonderful uh, harmony in my life. What I want and what I need are exactly the same. You couldn't give me anything I don't need. She carried a ballpoint pen, and I gave her stamps. And when she only asked me, and I said, oh, I have a lot of stamps. She said, oh, I need three stamps. I mean, like, I don't need a dozen stamps. I need three stamps. Extra fourth stamp would be a burden, you know? Where am I going to put it? It'll get damp in my pocket or something, you know? What kind of shoes do you wear? Six old children's shoes. They walk about 1,500 miles a pair for me. I'm on the 29th pair, so if I counted my mileage by the shoes, it would be much more than I claim. One of the most difficult things to do with peace was to give her something. And I had to trick her. And when she would come to see me, we'd have, a, we'd have an argument. Peace, you need new shoes. No, they'll last a little bit longer. Peace, you need new shoes. Those are terrible. They're gonna fall off your feet. No, I'm, it will 
we can wait. And uh, it's I mean, sneaky. I'd go into a a a, a, a mall, drive and say, hey, Mark, come with me, please. Where are you going? Well, I'm going over here for a moment. Go right up to the place where she has to buy the shoes. And I said, peace, there's your shoes. I know people must think I feel poor because I'm penniless, but I don't feel poor. I have actually great blessings, and therefore I feel rich. I have health, happiness, inner peace, things you couldn't buy if you were a billionaire. I'm thankful every moment of my life for the great riches that have come to me. I have discovered that unnecessary possessions are just unnecessary burdens. If you have them, you have to take care of them. I own only what I wear and the few things I carry in my little pockets. This is me and my only earthly possession standing before you. Just think how free I am. How old are you? I no longer know, and I'm so thankful. I had to put out of my mind how old I am, how old I was when I started, and how old I was when I began my preparation for the pilgrimage, and I've done that now. I am ageless and in radiant health. Now let me answer the most common question that I am asked. How in the world did you ever get started on a thing like that? I came from a very quiet life. I was born on a small farm, on the outskirts of a small town. I had a woods to play in and a creek to swim in and room to grow. And I would wish for all children a situation where they have room to grow. Because I look at plants growing up too crowded together, and I realize that they never attain maximum growth. And we humans are a little like that, too. Now, I began to make some good choices when I was still quite young. For instance, my rule of first things first. And the golden rule influenced my life when I was quite young. I read it in history. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you, expressed in a lot of different ways. It was really pointing out that every culture had one. Well, it was different from anything I had ever read because it received an inner confirmation from me and affected my entire life. I carried it into high school with my little saying, if you want to make friends, you must be friendly. And that's an offshoot of the golden rule, a recognition that people react according to the influences brought to bear upon them. I still have it in my life today with my little saying, if you want to make peace, you must be peaceful, and that works too. She would never kill anything, not even a mosquito. I can remember, we had a lot of them in this area at one time. I can remember her just brushing the mosquitoes off. She wouldn't kill them because uh, she said she wouldn't kill another living thing. I never thought of her as being athletic enough to walk all those miles. She was strong and agile and all that sort of thing, and was an excellent swimmer and could swim far and uh, do all sorts of tricks in the water. But, uh, you know, that's one thing, but walking across the continent is something altogether different. I remember when I was a child, I was offered real cigarettes from a package, which I didn't smoke, but my friends did. In high school, I was offered every kind of alcohol you can think of, which I didn't drink, but my friends did. Now, I faced a test in this regard just beyond my student days. 
all my friends at that time used both alcohol and tobacco. And with this push toward conformity in those days, they actually looked down on me because I didn't. And gathered in someone's living room, I said to them, look, life is a series of choices. Nobody can stop you from making your choices, but I have a right to make my choices too. And I have chosen freedom. There was a period when Mildred was the, uh, I can remember one picture in particular stands out in my mind where she was very much the flapper. She loved to dance, I remember that. She had several boyfriends that used to take her down to the piers in Atlantic City and they'd dance. She wouldn't just have dresses and shoes. It would be a coordinated outfit. And then she knows how to pose and turn like uh, Greta Garbo, you know, and all that sort of thing, yeah. I think she was more fashionable than average for a small town. She was actually the first woman ever to hike the um, entire Appalachian Trail. And I know she used to, when she was in those hiking days, she'd always bring home a couple of, like, people that she hiked with, you know, sort of stray people. She'd always pick up stray people all over the place. Maybe there were people she was sort of helping. She used to, you know, just talk to a lot of people. Before a life can be in harmony, it must be in harmony with its part in God's plan. You know, every one of us has a unique part in God's plan, which we cannot learn from without, which we must learn from within. And therefore, if you do not yet know clearly where you fit into God's plan, seek it in receptive silence. of a feeling of deep seeking for a meaningful way of life, I began to walk one night through the woods with the feeling that I would continue to walk until I found what I was seeking. And after I had walked almost all night, I came out into a clearing where the moonlight was shining down. And I found myself saying, if you can use me for anything, please use me. And I found myself feeling, here I am, take all of me, use me as you will, I withhold nothing. And then, of course, I felt I had found what I was seeking. I experienced the complete willingness without any reservations whatsoever to give my life to something beyond myself. But then I discovered that there is a great difference between the willingness to give and the actual giving. In my life, 15 years lay between. Well, she was 20. 19 or 20 when I met her, and she was like a normal girl. Those days, a normal girl of 19, 20, except she never was interested in cooking or anything like that. <laughs> well, she just wasn't a homemaker. That's all there was to it. No way, shape, or form that she was she a homemaker. And that's what I wanted. I wanted a home and family. Children were not ever in her lifestyle. She didn't have the mother instinct I think that most women have. And he couldn't accept the fact that she had something to say. And she had not only something to say, but she said it, definitely. But she wanted. There was no question about it. There are certain things that she would accept and certain things she wouldn't. And if she didn't accept them, that was it. During the years that we lived together, she really didn't have a goal. The goal was, I mean, naturally, I mean, a broad thing. Uh, she wanted to 
no war and peace. And she wanted me to go to prison rather than going to service. She would come to visit me. And, uh, of course, I didn't. I, I didn't volunteer, but when I was drafted, I, drafted, I went and I served. He had asked her to go with him to the camp. And she wrote me a letter back that as long as I was in the service, she would not go to visit me. She would not have anything to do with me as living with me. And she absolutely, in fact, I had taken that letter to my commanding officer, and he said, you know, that's grounds for divorce. When the divorce was over, then there was no ties. They did one thing for her, let her live her life the way she wanted. She lived very comfortably, but was not happy. Had what she said the world would call success, uh, what the world would think of as having it made, so to speak. But this unrest in her soul and then she had this vision, this calling to do this walking for peace. And um, she had the struggle inside of herself because she said, why would I leave this? She obviously had beautiful gardens around her home and she loved flowers. But she said, why would I leave this to, to impoverish myself? And she thought, but am I not impoverished where I am? I'm not a happy woman. I'm not what you would call a peaceful woman. My life is full of unrest. I'll give it a try. When the world is fighting, fighting, I am finding peace. Where do you think her faith came from? <laughs> but believe me, I don't know. That's just a thing that mystifies me because I won't say that she wasn't a caring person. She was a, uh, not a, uh, an unsympathetic person or anything, but still, I mean, she never, she wasn't too much out of the ordinary as far as, uh, you know, making the sacrifice she did to express our ideas. And I don't know where it came from. She had severed her old relationships. The uh, local people didn't go along with her, family didn't go along with her, and she just brushed that aside. This was more important. She started out as not learning to walk until she was a year and a half, which was rather late. <laughs> and uh, then she walked all those miles. She started out eating nothing but meat. She never would. The only vegetable I think she ever liked was green beans. And uh, then she became a vegetarian. She was not uh, too tolerant of my friends and all. She was. Uh, uh, a little critical at times, you know, a little prejudiced maybe. And uh, later she became, she loved everyone, you know. So I found a lot of contrasts between her life with two children and uh, her childhood in, in those respects. Forty years ago, I started what I have come to call a spiritual growing up or a psychological growing up. It takes you from the self-centered life or the life governed by the self-centered nature into the life governed by the nature which is centered in the good of the whole, which sees you as a part of the whole and works for the good of the whole, which sees that you're a cell in the body of humanity, that every cell, every human being has, well, equal uh, importance, equal potential, although in varied stages of growth because we choose how much growing we do, and a job to do in the total scheme of things. That was my preparation for the pilgrimage. It took 15 years. She called herself Peace Pill. This land for peace. Twenty-five thousand.
thousand miles she walked along with no possessions but the clothes upon her back no money in her pocket yet nothing did she lack nothing did she lack Hi. will there be peace or war the fateful question posed by Warren Austin, head of the United States delegation to the UN, set the mood of the world at the century's halfway mark. A highly trained and well-equipped North Korean army swarmed across the 38th parallel to attack unprepared South Korean defenders. I have walked 6,900 miles of my 10,000-mile pilgrimage for peace. My first 5,000 miles took me from coast to coast and from border to border. My second 5,000 miles is taking me at least 100 miles in every state, Mexico and Canada, all was ending at the capital. The cost was high to Americans who bore the brunt under the UN banner. Now, uh, is it true that the House Committee on Un-American Activities is considering an investigation of the clergy? The investigation of communism and communists in this country should take place wherever it be found. Increased range, guided missiles were added to the underseas arsenal, and the submarine became a more formidable weapon of counterattack on enemy coasts. The year had indeed seen a revolutionary step forward in naval warfare and the nation's defense. peace, but peace with all, came to Korea in 1953, the end of three years of bitter conflict and the end of bondage for prisoners of the Reds. Where are you from originally, or is that being kept uh, a secret? Well, I was born in the state of New Jersey, but of course I have no home now. Wherever I am is my home. Right now it's Mississippi, and they've been treating me very well. Thanks a lot, and good luck, Peace Pilgrim. President Eisenhower began his second term as leader, not only of America, but all free peoples. His inauguration address was a peace plea. May the turbulence of our age yield to the true time of peace, when men and nations shall share a life that honors the dignity of each. I think no negative thoughts, because the thing that can really destroy you is negative thinking. And so I always think about the best that could happen, all the good things I want to see happen, because those are the things I want to emphasize. Intense fighting both on the ground, inside the buffer zone, and in the air sends Vietnam casualty figures to a new high. We've happened to live because of the ingenuity of science. And man's own inability to control his relationship one with another. We happen to live in the most dangerous time in the history of the human race. I receive these letters. Sometimes it's true, they have written to their congressmen, they have joined the Peace Corps. Sometimes, well, a lady wrote and said, since talking with you, I have resolved an unpeaceful situation between myself and my sister-in-law. And a high school girl wrote and said, since talking with you, I have made peace with my girlfriend. They land in full battle gear, but meet no opposition from the guerrillas known to be in the area. Others of the 3,500 Marines are to come by air transport. Their duty will be strictly defensive, but they will shoot back if attacked. Marines usually do. Where do you go from here, Peace Pilgrim, and what is your future? 
I'll be in Youngstown over the weekend. Then I'm heading south, Steubenville first, and then southern Ohio. I'm covering the entire east this year. As to my future, my vow says I shall remain a wanderer until mankind has learned the way of peace. But I'm an optimistic peace pilgrim. I expect to see world peace in my lifetime. I believe that peace is an idea whose time has come. Well, good luck to you Thank and you. your cause. Thank you. Mr. Kennedy presented a manifesto for peace in momentous and moving words. Ladies and gentlemen of this assembly, the decision is ours. Never have the nations of the world had so much to lose or so much to gain. Together we shall save our planet, or together we shall perish in its flames. Save it we can, and save it we must. And then shall we earn the eternal thanks of mankind and, as peacemakers, the eternal blessing of God. At 1.25, the motorcade moves into the downtown area. Death is six minutes away. In a warehouse, a sniper with a rifle poised waits. <coughs> Furious fighting on the eve of another brief ceasefire with predictions of an air war slowdown and a new U.S. peace bid at the United Nations. You know, I started with no previous athletic ability. And I started after my hair had turned to silver. My friends thought I had taken leave of my senses, but of course, if walking is your calling, you can walk. And I also have no speaking experience. I had led a very quiet life. I had never seen the inside of a radio or a television station, but I never had stage fright or night fright. If speaking is your calling, you can speak. <laughs> We've been walking and talking with a woman who calls herself Peace Pilgrim, who walks across the nation in search of peace and goodwill for men. The basic conflict in our world today is not between nations. It is between two opposing beliefs the belief that you can overcome evil with more evil. And of course, those people are busy multiplying the evil. This is the war way. And the belief, which is my way, and I'm sure it's your way, I'm sure many people relate to this, the belief that evil can only be overcome by good. That's the basic conflict in our world today. She left behind a legacy of simplicity and love Every step she took was for this world we're dreaming of Powered by an inner strength that comes from above, from above A companion peace demonstration brings out 50,000 marchers in downtown San Francisco. They parade two miles along Market Street, pacifists and hippies together. You uh, say that you own nothing, you don't worry about tomorrow, uh, you just travel from community to community. Uh, might you agree that you were almost the forerunner of today's hippie? Well, actually, I suppose the original hippies back about four years ago or something like that um, would have agreed with me on one thing. They also were completely through with violence. Uh, they believed, I'm not sure they always practiced, but they believed uh, that actually the way to go was the way of nonviolence and love. And of course, my message says, this is the way of peace, overcome evil with good and falsehood with truth and hatred with love. It's sort of a happy happening for hippies. You're out if you're not in a BM, the recurring theme of which is love one another. The important thing was not to talk about peace, but to get peace and to get the right kind of peace. This we have done. I think peace in the world is much closer now. What we basically suffer from in the world is immaturity. If we were mature people, peace would be assured. Have you had any experiences which made you wonder about people, or do you always get treated hospitably? Oh, people are 
good. I have no doubt of that. Uh, I have to uh, really think back to my tests if I want to tell you anything that might be considered an adverse experience. And I don't consider it an adverse experience. Life is a series of tests. But if you pass your test, you look back upon it as a good experience. I was hit once in my first test by a disturbed teenage boy who was terrified by a thunder shower. I had taken him for a walk. I thought it would do him good. And he went off the beam when that thunder shower came along and he came for me. And I didn't even try to run away, which I guess I could have done. He had a heavy pack on his back. And even while he began to hit me, I could only feel the deepest compassion for him. How terrible to be so psychologically sick that you would be able to hit an old woman. I faced his hatred with love even while he hit me. And as a result, it reached that spark of good in him. All was there, no matter how deeply buried. And he experienced remorse. And to make a long story short, what are a few bruises on my body in comparison with the transformation of a human life? He never was violent again. He's a useful person in this world today. Now, one more, and that is the time I had to defend the frail little eight-year-old girl against a large man who was about to beat her, and the girl was terrified. Well, I knew her danger because of her fear. You attract what you fear. So I put my body between the man and the girl. I just stood and looked at that poor, psychologically sick man with loving compassion. He came close. He stopped. He looked at me for quite a while. He turned around, walked away, and the girl was safe. Now, what was the alternative? Suppose I had been so foolish as to attempt to use the jungle law of tooth and claw. I would undoubtedly be dead today, and so would the little girl. Let us never underestimate the great power of the way of love, which reaches that spark of good in the other person, and the person is disarmed. Following her first steps as Peace Pilgrim, on New Year's Day, 1953, Peace crisscrossed the nation seven times, visiting every state capital and every town with a population over 10,000, as well as many smaller communities and distant byways. After 25,000 miles, she stopped counting, but kept walking, focusing on an increasingly full schedule of speaking appearances in schools, churches, colleges, and on radio and television. The chaos in the world around us is a reflection of the inharmony within us. In the final analysis, only as we become more peaceful people will we find ourselves living in a more peaceful world. She was so true to her beliefs. She never deviated from them, as far as I can see. I mean, she was so true. She didn't, you know, like I would, we'd go on a diet, but we'll, we'll cheat a little mm -hmm. bit or something. She never strayed from, from her principles and her beliefs. So if you really believe a thing, you do the thing. Not what you say you believe. Uh, there is the uh, Confucian saying that to know and not to do is in fact not to know. A number of people say they know, they know this and they know that and they want this or they want that. They don't really, they don't really know. You see, if a person really knew that what goes around comes around, they wouldn't commit evil acts. If they knew it, they say it, they intellectually have embraced it. But to know it means you know it in your bones, you know it. The marrow of your bones is imprinted with that knowledge, you can't do otherwise when you know it. So Peace Pilgrim knew it, and so she did it. Peace uh, and harmony not come from sky, not, not as, a, as a, the result of our prayer alone, but we must act.
I walk until given shelter. I fast until given food. I do not ask. These things must be given. And just think, without ever asking, these things have been supplied. Aren't people good? Thank you. It's a joy to be with you. It was an interesting time uh, that I discovered her because it was during the Cold War and there was this real uh, conflict between the United States and uh, the Soviet Union and there was a real threat of uh, nuclear war and, and uh, which would totally destroyed the whole world, everything living on it. And here was this woman, this individual that had the courage to say, no, I am going to promote peace, never mind what other people are doing, never mind what the Soviet Union, uh, how it's threatening us or how we're threatening the Soviet Union with all of those missiles pointed at each other. And here was this woman that was walking her talk, I mean, literally walking her talk, and uh, walking across the United States promoting peace. And the thing that, that really was so wonderful about her was that she knew that peace started within us and that it was an individual happening, that it had to happen with individuals one by one by one. And it was so inspiring to me that it, it certainly changed my consciousness, my awareness, and the direction that I was thinking, and, and certainly changed the activity of mine also. So she was very influential and inspirational in my life at that time. Do you think the world is more at peace now because of your efforts? Well, I, of course, only the world is more at peace because of the efforts of all peacemakers put together. Uh, you see, when I started out, why people accepted war as a necessary part of life, but now I'm on the popular side because peace has become a matter of survival, and even the most immature people wish to survive. In my frame of reference, I'm not the body. I'm only wearing the body. I'm that which activates the body. That's the reality. Now, if I am killed, it destroys merely the body, which is transient anyway. That last night she was here, she did what many people felt was a wonderful healing experience. And many people noticed that. She kept looking up during her talk with the people. And finally, she just came down the steps and, and started moving around through the congregation that was there. And she just would reach out and just touch people and say, bless you, and go to the next and all. Walked around, and there wasn't a sound in the room. And when it was all over, she walked back up and she looked up again and she said, I never say goodbye, but this has been a very special night for me, and I just want to bless all of you, and, and I'll be seeing you. And many, many people came to me and said, you know, she looked very different, but what was she looking at? The night before that, she and I had sat for a long time and just talked, and she had never talked about death before, while well, neither one of us had. And she said, you know, I want you to join me in prayer. This is really what I want to ask of you tonight, that when my work here on this planet Earth is done, that I move out like that, that I go very quickly.
Well, I got a phone call from my husband uh, at work. And he came to pick me up. And of course, it was a shock. I just didn't think that. I had no, I just always felt that she was going to outlive me. Blessed are those who bring peace. It was a beautiful ceremony down at the Methodist Church. And they had asked us to speak for just a few minutes. And I remember I spoke longer than that because I had interviewed her. And I had so much that I, I, I wanted to share. And I don't know how long I talked. But uh, I think it was longer than five minutes. And no one seemed to mind because we were just grieving. I celebrated when she died, the way she died, because she lived in character, and she certainly was a character who did her own thing and believed in it. And she died on the road. She died the way she lived. That was a big blessing. That was a blessing from the heavens. In 1982, many of Peace's words were gathered and compiled by a group of five admirers into a book. Peace Pilgrim, her life and work in her own words. As friends of Peace Pilgrim, they published this book and have also kept in print Peace's little booklet, Steps Toward Inner Peace. We're just so lucky to have something so wonderful to do in our retirement years. These books and booklets, along with video and audio tapes, are circulated to all who ask for them, sent free to anyone who requests a copy or several copies. The Little Steps Toward Inner Peace booklet that um, so many people love, we've, we've sent out, we filled requests and sent out over a million of these around the world into over a hundred countries. Uh, when asked if she uh, had written a book, she'd say no, but I've written enough for there to be a book. And I think we took that as our commission, our challenge, to meet that challenge, to, uh, to put in book form that which Peace had already done and said. That we wanted to present this book in the same spirit that Peace Pilgrim had given her message in life. And that is, she always felt that she spoke spiritual truth. And she believed that spiritual truth should not be sold and never need be bought. Because when you're ready, it will be given. Now we thought, how are we going to translate that into distributing a book? I mean, obviously, it's going to cost us money to even put this book together, to have it published. How are we going to do this? Some people thought we were crazy to offer a book free. They said, if, well, if they don't pay for something, they won't think it's very valuable. But well, that's not true. They, they think it is valuable. I don't think John and Leanne had any idea beyond their fondest imagination that it would take off the way it did. We figured we might have one printing, maybe two printings. But the money kept pouring in, and the money kept pouring in, and we kept reprinting it, and reprinting it, and reprinting it, and now it's a spiritual classic. It doesn't stop. In fact, I think there's more and more distribution every year. There are enough uh, good people in this affluent country that want to do good things, and maybe they don't have time from their jobs, and so they're happy to send a larger amount of money than uh, the uh, books that they ask for. So that's how we keep going. What you need to do is to give me your name and address and we'll send you however many books you'd like. Just one? Okay, that's because you haven't seen it. I never knew uh, the woman who called herself Peace of Pilgrim. I never knew her personally, never met her. 
I was just one of those uh, many, many thousands and hopefully millions of people who were exposed to her own life and teaching through one of the, her book, of the Story of Her Life or One of the Steps to Your Peace. We have 26 uh, different translations of the Steps booklet in Spanish, French, German, Dutch, uh, Finnish, Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, um, and in Arabic, and Hebrew, and Chinese. Wouldn't it be better to uplift each other than to destroy each other? That's the, the simple question that Peace Pilgrim asked by virtue of the way she lived. And that's the question all of us have to ask. We can't escape it. We can try, we can drink ourselves to death, we can uh, adopt addictions and patterns of life to try to compensate and deny and, and keep ourselves from seeing it, but it's still there. And I'll tell you something, on our deathbed, it's gonna be right there in front of us. How did you live? You lived in this particular time, in this particular culture, given these particular circumstances. Was your life an answer? Or was it part of the problem? I says, you must have secrets. You must have certain things. You know, this just isn't your whole message, you know. And she kept insisting, I don't have secrets. I said, you've got to have secrets. But tell me, you know, what, what, you know, what's your secret? You know, I'm looking. Finally, she said, I have a secret. But I would not call it that. There was a time, long ago, when I died, utterly died to myself. And when she said it, her eyes like were f far away, like she was remembering something, or not remembering something. And then she looked back at me, and our eyes met, and as if, as if she said too much, that's the way I felt. It's as if she said too much, and she just turned around and then walked away. There is darkness in our world today. Yes, it is due to the disintegration of things which are contrary to the divine law of love. But let us never say hopelessly, oh, this is the darkness before a storm. Let us rather say with faith, this is the darkness before the dawn of a golden age of peace, which we cannot now even imagine. For this, let us hope and work and pray.
She left behind a legacy of simplicity and love. Every step she took was for this world we're dreaming of. I'm 